Welcome into the Kevin and Jason Show Playoff Edition Week 1 of the Playoffs. I'm your host today, Kevin Masseri, here with Jason Shannon discussing this big Bills versus Texans matchup. One of the matchups we've been waiting for all season long. One matchup that I think Bills fans, with everything and everyone in the playoffs, the Bills fans are really enjoying. Going to go through this matchup inside and out. Lots of stuff to talk about in the uh, secondary of the Texans. Lots of stuff to talk about on the Bills offense. What we're liking, what we're not liking. Maybe some injury notes and nuggets. Jason, how you doing today? What a time to be alive, Kevin. I uh, This feels so different than two years ago. Certainly feels different than last year. But uh, I'm really going in with hope. Uh, in 2017, I, I didn't think the Bills were very good, but we really had the hope that we were playing against Blake Bortles, and that was really our ticket to, this, to the divisional round. Right. This year, I think we have a team that can do it. I, I think we have a team that can go and beat a legitimate team. I think Houston is a legitimate team to play against. They're a division winner. Um, they're solid. They have one of the best five performing quarterbacks in the league right now. I think we can take it to them. I'm confident in this team. I can't wait for Saturday. Yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, yeah, you hit it to kind of recap in 2017. There was really no hope other than the fact that you're playing the Jaguars. They're, they're the Jaguars and have much of an advantage. It's good weather. It's you know, their fans. And then Blake Bortles that ended up being like 100 yards rushing. Blake Bortles was the, the only thing that happened in that game. I think that was the only thing that happened. Their defense was legitimate on the Bills level this year. That was a really good defense. And I just – with that Bills offense, we just knew much, you know, not much. It was going to take a Blake Bortles bad game. We didn't quite get that. We got a not very good passing game, but we got a good enough Blake Bortles. And then he went on to play like really good and then never good again. Um, he played good in the next two weeks following that. So, I mean, it's easy to do with, they had a really good defense that year. Um, yeah. Bills are following in that suit. I mean, I think it's a very similar, similar matchup this time with the Bills having a really strong defense, really good offense in terms of the Texans with a quarterback. I mean, they have gaps and holes without Will Fuller potentially not expected to play at this point. Things could change, I guess. Um, missing their right tackle. They've had, uh, I spoke with uh, a lot of people over at the Texans today. I'm on their podcast. So I will tweet out links to, so you can hear that show um, here uh, today. So you know, check that out. I'll be over there talking on their SB Nation blogs, uh, official podcast. So that will be fun. Matt Weston over there. Um they're having a big problem at right tackle and they're really nervous about these bills, defensive ends, Jason. That's what we'll start this show with the, the, the Texans offense. I mean, they're going with a combo, Chris Clark, Roderick Johnson swap thing that they're doing there. Like in the, in the mold of, of Ford and Inseki, but how they put it is they don't have a guy developing. Um, they have a couple of just replacement level right tackles. What do you see? I mean, do you think that that's, that's pivotal? And, and, and who would you like lined up against potentially their weak link there in their right tackle, Jason? What, 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 are, what are your initial ways to attack this Texans offense with a really good quarterback? Yeah, I mean, the pressure is certainly going to be important for us. I think our secondary can hold up and do its job, but you, you're not going to be able to give Watson all day. Um, the Houston offensive line has been a problem the last couple of years. It's been a very serious problem uh, when they drafted uh, – Titus Howard and sort of overdrafted him in some people's eyes. They That was really a move to solidify that line. And not only is he, you know, not only is he underdeveloped right now, but he's not even playing right now because he's IR. So we do have the Chris, Chris Clark, Roderick Johnson situation. I, I, I mean, I'd like to see faster players who are going to get the pressure. This might be a, a good Jerry Hughes game to put it on him. Yep. Um, just, you know, even if he's not getting the sacks, which it just doesn't seem like he's gotten there this year, uh, he would be a good guy to go against those guys. Um, you know, it, I'd like to see really all of them but Murphy. I mean, I, I think these guys can can tee off, and that that's the opportunity to do it. Obviously, you got Tunsil on the other side. Um, at left guard, you have Max Sharping, who's a you know a young, small school, second round pick guy. He might not be ready for the situation right now. So I think the pressure is going to be important, and it's not something that the Bills do game by game, but I think it's something that's increased at the end of the year as they've played better teams and some better offensive lines. Um, I think they've really put it together, uh, you know, after a really stagnant start to the year. I feel like after, you know, like the Eagles game, I think that it's been an improved unit. Yep. Uh, obviously, Shaq Lawson's been improved. Jordan Phillips is beginning his cleanup sacks. Even Trent Murphy's been doing stuff. I, I think it's going to be really important, and Houston's going to have to step up in, in the same way that the Bills are going to step up. But I would give it 
advantage Bills at this point as one of the key battles of the game. Yeah, I mean, Sharping, like you mentioned, is a rookie. That they're, he's been pretty good in run block, or pretty good in pass block, and so is Sharping. But um, both have really struggled in, in run blocking. So um, I, there's definitely opportunity against on this offensive line, and I, I think that that's what's limited um, Deshaun Watson a lot. I mean, Nick Martin's been a pretty good, pretty good, once again, a pretty good time. I mean, all their guys are pretty much struggling on run blocking. So that's, you know, when I was over there, you know, talking to to their blog, um they just don't think that they have a good enough running game and run blocking to, to really take advantage of maybe what would be the bills weakness. And most of the teams that have beat the bills between Chubb, um, Her- Kareem Hunt's first game back. And then you had the new England mishmash of running backs. And then you had the Jordan Howard, Miles Sanders combo. Um, that was annoying. Uh, every, I mean, those are their losses right there. And then, and then you add in the meaningless jets game, um, which just wasn't really a game um, that, you they all ran the ball I mean they're it, it, none of them didn't run the ball and beat the team you know beat the Bills in the air so um do the do you think that the Texans have a good enough running game with this offensive line factoring in Watson a little bit Duke Johnson Carlos Hyde that's it I mean that's that's the names so Watson Johnson and Hyde do you see anything there that's worrisome or are these just going to be your run of the mill I mean it's not going to be anything better than you know the Bills have had to face this year yeah, I mean, I, I think you always have to worry about Watson, and especially in the red zone, it's the same sort of deal. He's got seven touchdowns this year. I think a lot of people were surprised by Carlos Hyde this season. Um, you know, 4.4 yards rush is good. But I think in general, I mean, I would rank this rushing attack, I think, behind any of the teams that we lost to. Yep. I, I don't see that kind of game. I think that Watson's always a guy that you can you can worry about. I think that Duke Johnson, you know, if we're just talking about the backfield position as a guy out of the backfield in the receiving game that could cause problems because, you know, there's always going to be random games where we just can't stop the screen, um, you know, especially against New England for the past 20 years. But – uh, in terms of running games, in terms of downfield running and um, creative running, like I don't see much in the running backs or the run blocking that's going to be a big problem for this team. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm never going to discount a team with Watson, you know, especially inside the 20 to do Josh Allen type stuff with his feet. And obviously, you know, being a better passer, right? Uh, you know, Teams with stars worry me sometimes, and I said it before the Eagles game when they were all playing pretty poorly, and I said, you know, Carson Wentz might just go and have his best game of the season. We know that he's capable of it, and I still think that the focus is on Watson in terms of making a game, and he's had good games and he's had bad games, but I, I do I do think that we have a lot of this under control, but when you have a combination like Watson to Hopkins and Hop- Watson coming out of the backfield, I think those are going to be your big worries there. So. The, my answer is, you know, if Car- Carlos Hyde kills us, like we probably lost, um, but I don't think he will. I think they're going to have to win another way if they're going to win, but it'd be a pretty bad sign if he did. Now, what do you think happens at cornerback too uh, against this, this in this game? I mean, Trey, I, I don't think he was leading to a smokescreen mid mid interview where he mentioned Kevin Johnson being on the other side, of the right side of the field. Um, do you think that it's Kevin Johnson game specifically? I mean, without Will Fuller, that really takes takes some heat off of the secondary. Um, and do, do you think that there is even a, a downfall from Levi Wallace to Kevin Johnson? No, not really. I think that he might be the guy for this game, and he played. I mean, he played for Houston. He knows those guys pretty well. He played for Houston every year of his career before this year, uh, so he's familiar with the players. Uh, I think he's bigger and faster than Levi Wallace. And, um, you know, it depends on what's going on with Will Fuller. Yep. But I think in general, you know, they're a team, they're a team with one superstar, super, superstar receiver and two more really good ones. And I don't think Kiki QT is particularly great, but you know, he's another serviceable guy. Uh, We're going to need as many cornerbacks as we can get, but in terms of the, the outside, yeah. I mean, I feel comfortable with that one-to-one swap. The problem becomes, you know, what the what the depth is going to be. And obviously we saw it last week when, when you know, Isaiah McKenzie had to come into the game because we had a couple injuries. Uh, you know, we really only have three outside cornerbacks on this team. So once you go down Levi Wallace, you're really running into problems at that point. 
Right. And I mean, so you have Kiki Kute, um, who's going to fill in as, at probably in the slot. Um, guy that's going to match up real well, Taron Johnson, you know, 5'11", 187, only had 254 yards this year. Showed some promise last year, but just 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 didn't quite do it. He doesn't have enough. I mean, I don't, I don't even know. Like, he's probably on the level of Isaiah McKenzie at this point. Um, so that's – it's a big difference for them to, 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 to have that loss. So, I mean, let's, let's say that that – obviously, Taron Johnson is able to at least keep him in check. DeAndre Hopkins is going to do DeAndre Hopkins' numbers, but he's against Trey White. So, do you shadow him around with Trey White? Do you let him go into the slot and then play Taron Johnson and Micah Hyde? What, what do you do with DeAndre Hopkins knowing that potentially, most likely, no Will Fuller? Yeah, I think at that point you have to follow him around. I think Kenny Stills is a dangerous guy, but I, I think by far your biggest threat in this game is DeAndre Hopkins. And I think he can make some guys look pretty foolish. And I, I do. I feel confident that, that DeAndre Hopkins' game is probably going to be like five for 60 on Trey White. I think it could get a lot worse if we start moving guys around and he gets into situations where he's playing on Taron Johnson and, you know, even Kevin Johnson. I, I think that – this is the game. They have a superstar receiver. Uh, he's the best or second best in the league. We have maybe the second best cornerback in the league. Let's just match it up. Let's go. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I just can't. You can't let him kill us. It's he's the guy that could kill us. You can't lose the game because you wanted to let him play against Taron Johnson, right? Like you just, you just, you can't do that. Like that would be just. This isn't a regular season game where you know there's tomorrow and you can try different things on this. I mean, I, I just think you need to go down with best on best. Like I, I just don't think you ever, especially without Will Fuller. Um, I just don't think you can ever let that happen, right? Or, or, or do you? Is there some scheme where him guarding um, Kenny Stills, Trey White taking Kenny Stills out, and then double covering Hopkins? Is that? Do you like that method? Yeah, I mean, you want to move around white. The zone obviously gives it a different situation because we do play heavy zone. And I think there just needs to be white and probably a guy over top. And Or you shift and you you play the, the speed of stills more. Um, I guess you could do it either way. I feel pretty good about the secondary because that's a well-coached group. That's a, a mostly veteranish group. And to be honest, like, I think they've known they've, they're playing the Texans for three weeks now. Like, they – McDermott wasn't afraid to say during the Jets game that he was planning for the Texans and the Chiefs. And it was much more likely that we were going to play the Texans. Probably, you know, we kind of known since week 15 that this was going to happen. So um, it was always, I think they'll be ready for it. They're, they're the, you know, in a way the secondary is the, the unit I should be the least worried about. And even though they're playing against one of the better units for the Texans, you know, even without Will Fuller, I would still say it's pretty formidable. Uh, I think they're going to have this thing well planned out, and I don't think anybody's going to necessarily kill us. And usually if somebody kills us, it's going to be a rando, and I'm hoping it's not Kenny Stills or a one-legged Will Fuller. Uh, I just have to imagine they're going to have a plan for Hopkins. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I I think they do, and it could be as simple as Trey White, but I guess there could be some more intricacies in there. Um, and they're just a different team without Will Fuller. I mean, it 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 really is. Like, I just think that this this – Texans team statistically has played worse. He opens up the field. You know, he doesn't always go off. He can go off um, and does does help out a lot of his teammates. So he's been a really good football player for them when he's healthy. His issue that, is he's gotten hurt. That type of threat, even, you know, that deep threat, the guy that stretches the field really does make a difference even when he's not catching the ball. I mean, you just have to game plan differently. And even if he's 70 – percent as good as somebody else that would be in that position who maybe is running routes or whatever having a guy with that type of speed is changes how everybody looks at everything and they don't want to let anything go over the top luckily the bills are remarkably good at it best in the league over the last two years and 30 plus plays i believe allowed um they're they've been really good at it we don't get killed on huge plays and a lot of them that we have in the last year or two has been you know, breakdowns on long quarterback runs or stuff across the middle or whatever. We, we rarely let these guys kill us. So, you know, it, it feels pretty good to have him out or slow down or whatever. You know, I don't, I don't think that a 70% Will Fuller is going to be a huge problem for us. I, I think stills still give something athletically and size wise where I, I think he could cause some problems. I don't think we're, 
in the clear by any means with these receivers, but I mean, it, it totally changes the game plan. It, it kind of stinks that we don't know for sure whether he's going to be out or not, but you know, I'm sure they have plans for both and I'm sure that the plans are pretty different from each other. Yeah. And I think that they probably do, I mean, have a better idea if he's playing or not based on his injury. They, I mean, these teams just are so smart with this kind of stuff. Um, but just to kind of wrap it up, kind of wrap up the Texans offense and kind of prove that this is, it's a bigger deal than just a standard receiver injury. Houston's past DVOA, uh, where Fuller, Fuller's played is 35.4, fourth in the league. So 35.4%, I'm assuming, is effectiveness. And that's the DVO ranking, DVOAA ranking, uh, 115.3% on deep balls, which is 11th. Um, when he doesn't play, uh, they're negative 8.5%, good for 27th in the league. 17.6, so their deep balls cut to 17.6% from 115 um, so really cuts in 20th, um, good for 29th in the league. Uh, and they only throw 29 of them when he's not playing uh, total. So that sounds um, like a big difference, Kevin. It's a big difference. I mean, he, it, it, sure. He's at 700 yards. He doesn't play every game. I remember being really good against Buffalo last year and then he got hurt right in the game. Didn't he get hurt on catching the ball in the end zone? And am I thinking of that? I don't right remember, play? but that sounds great. Uh, I think he caught a touchdown. So many t- times he's been hurt. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 the truth but I believe that he got hurt on a touchdown play um I know that game ended up going into overtime a lot of people have been referencing that game I don't really think it's too relevant at all the Bills are a completely different team I guess they're kind of the same I guess would be why people keep bringing it up like this bad Bills team last year went there and played them pretty well which yeah. I don't think really matters but yeah he went for uh he got he did get hurt in the game but played the next week um, he went for two for 33 in that game prior to going out. So um, he's a difference maker. And I've always liked Will Fuller. I always thought if he could keep his health in check and some of the drops he had, I thought he was like a receiver one. Um, so I'm, I'm excited by him not being out. And um, I think that that's a big, big, big advantage to the Bills. Um, and I think the, the key in this game is keeping Watson under check. A lot of quarterbacks haven't beaten them. These running games, as we've mentioned, have beat the Bills this year. The quarterbacks really haven't. I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick still probably has one of the better games against the Bills. Other than that, Wentz played okay. Baker played okay. Brady wasn't great. It was okay last game. Um, I mean, do you think Watson can do this thing alone against this Bills defense? Do you think he's the best quarterback they've played, or do you think they put enough on tape against Lamar that there's a chance Watson doesn't take over? Yeah, I don't know if it's the same thing as Lamar. He's got more help than Lamar, even even with the fuller injury. Uh, Lamar is just having a special season, and he's got a different type of legs. It's mm-hmm. a different thing. It's a different type of mobility than Josh Allen. It's a different level of mobility than Deshaun Watson. So it is different. I still think Watson's a superior passer to him, so I, I am w- more worried about that. Um, but – you know, I, I do think that we've put on tape that we can stop really any sort of quarterback if we have our right game. Not that we stopped Lamar Jackson, but we probably we slowed him down to the level where if he hadn't thrown a couple of perfect throws, it wouldn't have looked like a very good game at all. Um, so yeah, I think we've shown it, and I think if your secondary is good enough, you can you can really do whatever you want. I mean, the secondary and the pass rush have to be there, and. I, I think that without Fuller and with if we can actually make stops on the run game, yeah, I think that cuts his chances down a lot. I'm not sure that he's quite at the level of quarterback that can do okay. something when nothing's there. I think he's a really, really good quarterback. He's a quarterback I'd want on my team. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that there's enough there to feel good about it as the Bills' defense. He's obviously a guy I don't want to play against. I'd rather play against – you know, I'd rather play Buck against Hodges. Ryan Tannehill right now. <laughs> no, I mean, that. yeah, I'm not even counting the Duck Hodgeses, but, you know, I'd rather play Dak Prescott again. I'd rather play Ryan Tannehill. I'd rather play, I don't know, all those other AFC <laughs> quarterbacks are pretty good. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think he's a – yeah, I don't know what else to say. I think the, the okay. it lines up – Everything lines up for the defense really well, except for the fact that they have a game changing quarterback. I think so too. I think he's That's, just so hard to account for. I don't think their offensive line's particularly good. I think they have some good wide receiver weapons. Their running backs are league average. Don't have anything in the tight end 
game that really scares me. Darren Fells does his Darren Fells thing. Jordan Aikens has shown a little bit. I mean, there's there's not a lot there. Kenny Stills was a trade from Miami with Tunsil. I, I just – this team's 6-10 and 10 without Watson. What do you got him at without Deshaun Watson? It's a lot. I mean, it depends on who they're – Seven and nine? <laughs> well, the um, backup quarterback is A.J. McCarron, who was awful against Tennessee. Yeah, you know, I, I used to think that we that teams that quarterbacks were still only worth a couple games, but yeah, that's a without Deshaun Watson, that's a six and ten team. It's a six and ten team. Okay, let's flip to the side of the ball real quickly, Jason. Um, we got the Texans defense. I mean, much maligned, a little changing. Twenty eighth ranked. JJ Watt is back. I don't care how much they say he's going to play. Coming off a torn pec, a serious injury, he's not coming off of a uh, something minor. Um, he can play and he might be effective, but how much can he show that pounce and that power? Um, so I think you're going to see more in speed situations, um, pass situations, and you are in the dominant run game. Um, so JJ Watt's going to play. We've just been conflicting reports on how much Whitney Merciless has been good. They signed him to an extension. Zach Cunningham and been Derek McKinney in the middle. Uh, they've been good in this three, four defense. Um, reader's been great as a nose tackle, you know, something the bills probably wanted in Star Tule. Reader's been really good in a lot of advanced metrics. Um, their secondaries train rack, um, their backup pass rushers are bad. And Angela Blackson hasn't been very good waiver pickup from practice squad from the new England Patriots. Charles Amanu hasn't been very good the guy that dropped in the fifth round. Um, Jacob Martin, the guy they traded for from Davian Clowney, just started playing, has three sacks, but just started playing like late in the year. So I'm not sure if he was hurt or the situation exactly with Jacob Martin and Brandon Scarlett um, hasn't been very good either. It's, 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 a, it's a good to okay, uh, above average to okay um, front seven with a below average secondary of Jonathan Joseph, who's like 40. Julie Ladai filling in for an injured to Sean Gibson. Justin Reed's been pretty good. He's been easily their best player in the back. And like a 57-year-old Mike Adams, I mean, he's played on like every team now at safety. Um, if any injuries happen to Reed or Adai, he's the only guy there. Bradley Roby's been good, but he's been pretty much a second corner his whole career. Now he's a corner one. I mean, he's had good games, but he still isn't perfect. And then they just have a slew of problems behind Joseph and Broby. I mean, Lonnie Johnson's been bad. He's been benched. They had to get Hargraves, who's been pretty poor. Gary Conley's, I guess, been pretty good, but has had some good ball luck um, as per um, our Texans conversation. So, Jason, that's the, that's the Texans defense. I mean, the injuries away at every position from being in real deep trouble. Um what do you think of this this defense and how to attack it? Yeah, it's not a particularly deep group. I kind of wish that maybe we had switched the secondary and the front seven in terms of how good they were. I think it's a pretty good front seven. Um, you know, there's not a ton of teams with more than two pretty good linebackers, which if you don't even count Merciless, they have two pretty good ones in Cunningham and McKinney. Uh, the front three, full strength, is pretty good. DJ Reader has been really good. I think he's third in the league in beating double teams. Um, just a, a disruptive nose tackle, which is what everybody's kind of hoping for when they draft one of those giant guys, especially in the fifth round. Uh, it's the Terrell JJ Troop hope. Watt. That's all you're hoping for. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what kind of hope you would have had for Terrell Troop, but, you know, who never displayed it ever, but okay. Um, you know, and J.J. Watt is hurt, and it. I don't know the interviews and all the the sound bites they got from Texans people, uh, you know, from everybody, but JJ Watt didn't sound that optimistic about how much he's going to play. And JJ Watt was kind of did his, I'm ready to play every play, but we have a plan in place thing, um, which sounds like he's playing at most 50% of plays at this point. I I think you're right in terms of, you know, impact plays, he's going to be on the field. They're going to limit him that he's probably not going to be in on first downs. Um, you know, maybe they know something we don't. Maybe he does have superhuman healing power, which is possible because it's J.J. Watt. But I think in general, um, you know, it's better to face a slow down J.J. Watt than, you know, I'm not going to apologize for that. Uh, but I think in general it's still a pretty good front seven. And then you obviously okay. have Merciless. I, I think it's a, it's, it's a good unit. And I think that they – should be adequate at stopping the run. I think that they could get after the quarterback. Um, I think we have a playmaker and single tear that can kind of get around some of that stuff. If we can actually get the screen game going, 
and, you know, get him moving. I think Frank Gore's looked pretty okay the last couple of weeks in terms of his movement. He seems to be ready for this game. Obviously, you know, a, a big factor in all this is, you know, I don't know how big of a factor it is, but it's got to be at least a little bit of a factor is we got to rest uh, our three biggest skill position players, or four, I guess. Um, you know, Singletary sat, Brown and Beasley sat, Dawson Knox sat. You know, they got the – they got the superstar treatment and they have to go and make plays. Um, you know, I feel, I do feel good about us playing the secondary, which hasn't been very good. They've been particularly bad against slot receivers this year. So I, I would look for Beasley to eat in this game. I have to assume that the Texans know who they are as well. And maybe they move stuff around and maybe there's a little less attention on the second receiver. If it ends up being, Isaiah McKenzie or the, the man who should not be named um, they might move a guy off of him and maybe try to mess Beasley up because even though Beasley's done a really good job and been really shifty he's obviously still the size of a guy that can get pushed off the line like there's just nothing he can do about his physical stature and strength like he still really shouldn't be big enough to play the position but obviously plays it adequately because he's trained up has good feet does good routes all of that um but, yeah, I, I think that the offense – I'd feel pretty bad about the passing game if they had a really good secondary. I still have a tough time thinking that we're really going to get somewhere against the Patriots or, you know, a Ravens or somebody that has a really good secondary because I, I do think that if they're good enough at it, they can just shut us down and Josh Allen really has nowhere to go and the receivers get locked up. They're not particularly big guys. Um when I see a bad secondary or, or a below average secondary, I'm not necessarily thinking like this is going to be the Josh Allen 300 yard game. I'm just thinking like we can get to 24 points and that's going to be enough. Uh, right. That's all I want at this point. I'm not, I, at, I'm way past the point of being like, we're going to light these guys up. Um, I just want it to be possible. And I think that the running game's good enough to make way against an up, above average front seven. And I think that, um, their secondary is poor enough that we can really get some gains going. And, you know, you, you can see the, the Cole Beasley 40 yard run after catch sort of going sideways thing or John Brown beating a guy a couple times uh, for big plays. I, th- I think that that stuff can happen. And yeah, I think Jonathan Joseph's for the taking. I think, you know, I think Roby's pretty good, but um, whoever they decide on between Conley and Hargraves, I feel pretty good with. If I see Lonnie Johnson on the field at all, I'm throwing at him. And then, yeah, with a new uh, new safety end, um, that could be a, a a really big deal for us. And maybe we see uh, a Dawson Knox game or something. Yeah, I, I mean, so. they're they're missing. I mean, Tashawn Gibson, and they gave good money. Their center fielder. I mean, it's not it's not as good as Micah Hyde, but it's kind of like missing Micah Hyde in this game for them and them playing their Kirk Coleman or their Jaquan Johnson. Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's a loss. I mean, it's a loss that their safety combo, which was pretty good is, is split up to, to now half is good. Um, Jaleel dies an okay back up to have, but um, not only does it stretch your special teams in depth, I mean, it's, it's a big difference to have him on the field um, as compared to a true center fielder who he paid to be one. Uh, and then the kicking game, you have Kaimi Fairbairn, who has been pretty good this year, 20 for 25. Doesn't, they don't kick a ton. Um, missed three extra points, which I guess is something. Um, almost as many field goals as, as so. I mean, he's an 80% kicker. I guess it's the new standard. He's an average kicker. Nothing positive or negative there. Yeah, uh, he hasn't, is- hasn't missed under 40 this year. He's four from six in the 40s and three for six, 50 plus. Just to yeah, throw okay. that in. So it is, so it's five, sorry, it's five extra points he's missed. Um, yeah. So he, so that's where he's going to, for some reason, for someone that hasn't missed under 40, uh, misses five extra points, which, which is weird. It's, just a, it's a weird, weird correlation. A um, lot, lot like Hauschka, it seems to be pretty accurate from under 40. Five missed extra points is tough. Hasn't been great over 40 though. Um, so, you know, whatever. Um, I can't say too much there. Brian Anger's been the best punter in the league per the sharp stats I just read with Corey Biorquez being the worst bottom left corner for Corey Biorquez top right corner for Brian Anger. Um, uh, I forgot about Brian Anger that. Yeah. yeah it's going to be a, tw- ten, it could be a 10 yard difference in, in punter there. Man, um, yeah. It's tough. I, I can't say there's much it's of a swing tough. in the kicking game, um, but in the punting game um, we'll see if that matters. So, I mean, it's a big, 
nothing to, to, to report on for kicking. So that means that punting, I don't know. I hope we don't have to revisit this next week on why um, the Bills potentially didn't take a W and hopefully has nothing to do with Brian Inger and Corey Mayorkas. Okay. Um, Duke Williams. Do you have Duke Williams active? Yes or no? Just a simple, quick yes or no. Me? Yeah. Yeah. You have him active. Okay. Yeah. yeah Who do you scratch? That's, I mean, um, who would whoever, you scratch? Whoever they feel more comfortable out of, okay. out of Perry and Foster. Okay. Um, I'm, the, I'm there too. Um, do you see a need for anyone else, Sweeney or Yeldon? Either or? Then we got to keep doing the math and keep moving guys around. Cause I don't know that. I don't know if that sets. I, I mean, I want to, I want them all to be active. I think this is stupid. The rules are stupid. We're playing in week 17 and we only are allowed to play 47 guys and we have to sit healthy guys. Like it's requiring people to do double duty and do double duty that they don't have to. Even if we did a week 17, week 16, where we got to extend the rosters or we could Baseball cut the actives or something. Um, I think this is stupid and we're, 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 we're saving guys in week 17 because of health, but it's become like a completely opposite of reaction because we're having to play overplay guys. Okay. Um, Fair enough. I know that wasn't the answer. Um, I'd figure out a way to get Duke Williams on the field. Cause he, I think that one red zone target, one play he plays in the red zone is more important than whatever on special teams that Sonoris Perry or Robert Foster are going to do. That's yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's a game changing. I think that the Titans touchdown doesn't happen with another, any of the receivers that would have played in this place. And you know, what's funny is that game. Levi Wallace could make Duke um, Williams eligible because that might activate um, Dean Marlowe um, and Jaquan Jamal. Johnson, which are two special teams players um, because of numbers. So therefore you can scratch Perry or Foster. I mean, I think it's, it's, I prefer Perry. I think Foster can still play teams and add more to your offense. And I, I like the ability to have go to different packages, do different things. The only thing that worries me about, Perry is not having an emergency third running back. Right. Yeah. That would no, be the I'm, only difference for me is that, and then, you know, I mean, I'm, obviously I'm playing, I'm playing everybody would rather have Yeldon on the field than Perry, but I think between the special teams and just having an emergency third guy and not having a role the Patrick DeMarco. Um, I'm playing Patrick DeMarco over some Mars Perry. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. All right, I uh, think he's, I think he can be the emergency third. Um, but I, but anyways, I don't, I still don't think Duke will play, but. Who knows? Okay. I mean, I just think with a weekend secondary, I think that I just think providing something different. He's clearly performed. I don't want to hear yards per route on whatever. It's he's made plays when he's been given the opportunity to. Um, he gets open for a big guy. He's clearly practicing hard. It's obviously a reason why he's not playing. It's probably because he's not good at special teams than other players. Stupid. I understand it. Like, I don't need to be explained why he's not playing. Like, that's not the argument. The argument is just, it's just a phys- philosophical difference, I guess. Like, I just, he went for a hundred have- yards against their DB ones. It wasn't like they were playing pretty, like they were playing, Justin Rogers, they were playing their DB ones. Like, I'm not saying the Jets are like the best team in the league. They still have good safety. Like it's one of the best safety combos in the league. And they have like, Oh, like for that game specifically, they're playing their DB ones. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I thought he played a really good football game and you could rely on him. I think Josh Allen needs that. I think I play, I think that his 20 snaps on offense are a lot more valuable than the replacement. It's not just missing Sonoris Perry, right? It's the replacement difference from Sonoris Perry to Dean Marlowe or whatever the change that is made based on Levi Wallace's health. I mean, right. to me, Jordan Poyer plays 40% on special teams. Like, can Poyer play another snap on team in the playoffs? I, I, right. I, I think he can. Like, I don't yeah. think he's going to get hurt the one extra play he plays in the playoffs on teams. Um, yeah, no, I think though any of those are a possibility, and I think that – Pretending that yeah, going we're going to go from Sonoris Perry to zero. All these guys play special teams in the, in the preseason and in training camp. Duke Williams was playing special teams in the, uh, the entire training camp. They wanted him to be that guy, and maybe he was just short of it. But I think there's a lot of other guys that could do the job. I don't think we're going from NFL player to zero. 
you know, yeah, that's the difference. It's like, well, then now we don't have a special team. Well, it doesn't work like that. You do like, but what's the do. difference? First off, you have, you have backups in these guys. So yeah, we figure out what the difference is. What if he gets I, hurt? Of course you have a, of course there's a guys that can play special teams. It's the difference between Sonoris Perry's six plays affected on special teams and Dean Marlowe, six plays affected. That, um, yeah. I'm, I'm even going high on purpose. Six yeah, how plays. Many, how many, how many <laughs> plays are getting returned? We, we, cal- I calculate about six um, total in a game. And how many does Sonoris Perry affect? I don't know. I, I, I guess I don't know. Um, so the difference between that and then the 20 plays on snaps. So yeah, I'm not saying that, that Duke Williams is going to get active and go for buck 20. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think any Duke Williams person is saying that. I just think that the team doesn't have a receiver, too. You can still I want use there to McKenzie. be an option in the red zone. Right. Like, you can still use McKenzie. You can still use Robert Foster if he's active whatever like but you have 20 plays scripted out for duke williams i, I think that that can be important and he can still be in a, a, a special team in emergency situations or add depth to that you know i'm not saying he's he's particularly good at it but we're really we're really clowning up the if someone wants to show me that the, the relative dvoa effectiveness of sonoris perry over uh dean marlowe um i'm willing to listen to it i think that it becomes even more eligible without levi wallace because then you can activate um dean marlowe and Jaquan Johnson playing safety and Kurt Coleman that plays safety. Let me go down the backup linebackers um, that played Corey Thompson. And um, they, they, they played them all a lot on special teams. I've gone through the numbers. Um, Snarf Perry, I think was down to 35% of special team snaps. Um, so this isn't, this isn't a hundred percent. You're filling in for a, f- a six plays affected. I mean, if those six plays on special teams are more important than Duke Williams scripted plays. All right, fine. But when you, when you roster me, Julian Stanford, Corey Thompson, uh, the number one player that plays a lot on, on special teams, Jason, Daryl Johnson. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. You have a plenty of guys, especially if you can go with Siren Neal, who's another gamer. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's enough guys that the difference between Dean Marle stepping in for Snorris Perry isn't much. That's my case for Duke Williams. Yeah, mine's just it makes the offense better, and that's the most important thing in a football game. Yep. Mm-hmm. And the, the downgrade you're going to get in special teams just isn't that high. And the amount of special teams plays that are even returnable kicks right. or returnable right. punts anymore is, has right. gotten so low. I swear you know. some people think you don't like it because Duke Williams plays like you play with a man down on special teams or something. Like you think the difference between – like you legitimately think the difference between Sonoris Perry and or Robert Foster and Dean Marlowe is that big. Like you think that? Like is there is there a statistic there that – why you think that? So that's my argument for it. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously it's a skill to play special teams. It's I think um, so. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it definitely is. It's just I, I, right now we have a deficiency at receiver, at, right. at an outside receiver. We're not getting anything out of that position. It's the playoffs. Like, and we saw the proof of concept when, when we had the Titans game and we needed to go score a touchdown in the red zone – Duke Williams goes and muscles a guy off of him, turns it in, scores the winning touchdown, cries after the game, Bills win against the only playoff team we've beat all year. Let's go. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Like we like the process. We want to. We want to believe in every single thing that they do. Not everything they do is perfect. No, like, it's not. I mean, they went six and ten last year. I mean, like, like, yeah. We, been... we lost. We went to the playoffs in a season where we lost two games by like eighty points combined. There's yeah. luck involved. There's decisions. There's tinkering around with the lineup. They they didn't feel like they needed Duke Williams at that time. Maybe he wasn't ready at that time. I don't know. I've seen enough. I either, I mean, we can trust them all I want, and I can just like not have an opinion, or I can just give my opinion. My opinion is that he's the second. He's the third best receiver on this team. The third best receiver on this team should be playing. Yep. I'll take Isaiah McKenzie on the roster as a gadget guy. They're clearly not going to use Foster. I was a big Foster guy. It's clearly not going to be an effective part of this offense this year. Let's go get our third best receiver and put him in the game. That's yeah, and, and on top of it, they're, I mean, play him, play him against uh, – you have a unique advantage to have a guy that can be played. It's not always the case against Houston in the playoffs who's not ready for him. Like, they don't know if they need to watch Duke Williams' game tape. I mean, yeah, I, I just – I just think it's a unique advantage and I think you need to play him. And I think that those 20 and I'm going low. I mean, he got, he played a lot of snaps at points when he was playing 20 snaps um, against the six plays affected or eight, well, however high you want me to go eight plays affected on special team difference from um, to Norris Perry to do Dean Marlowe. I just, I just don't think it's there. And even if, even if Dean Marlowe can't play, and even if 
uh, Levi Wallace plays, I still think that there's players there that, that, that can get the job done on the special teams field. Um, so, and if not, I mean, I think that, I think that you make a cut and sign a freaking special team or so you do something then, um, around your roster to make Duke Williams eligible. That's all I'm trying to say. Like, I, I don't know. Do you need to have a couple of backup defensive tackles? I, I don't know. Like, is that, is that, is that super important? Um, but I mean, you have a couple of key special teamers that already play your entire backups are, are dedicated to special teams as it should be. Like, I'm not arguing that, but I am arguing the fact that it shouldn't be an excuse to not play, you know, your second, third or, you know, second or third receiver, or whatever you want to call them or fourth, even like, I think he needs to be active on game days. And I hope that they do it this week and I hope it works, Jason. So score predictions time. This is it. Give me your score prediction and why. Yeah, you go first. Mm. I've been pumping it all week. I got 24-20 Buffalo. I think they'd get this one done. I don't like Houston's defense very much. I could be fool if Josh Young goes and throws four picks. Um, but I think they can move the ball. I think they can stop their run. I think they can keep Watson in enough check. Will Fuller, they lose one of those deep threats. Um, 24-20 Buffalo, they move on and hopefully go Tennessee because the three teams are, you know, three of the teams remaining are like my least favorite teams, like Tennessee, New England, Baltimore. I hate all three of them. I hate all their yeah. fans. Um, so, but I am going to root one of the only times ever for Tennessee over New England, just because it opens up the door to play KC, which would have been our first round matchup for us. So yeah. I'm rooting for Tennessee and rooting for Buffalo. You never know what could happen um, against Kansas, Kansas City, and you never know what could happen. T- Tennessee seems to be playing good football. So that's my prediction, Jason. Um, I'm just going to straight co-sign it and just make it a podcast prediction, a uh, Kevin and Jason show prediction. I was thinking about 24-20. I, I'm in on it. 24-20. It. Yeah, yeah, let's just go win this. First win in since, what, 95? Um, so that's what I'm predicting. I think they can do it. Obviously, football games can go a multitude of ways. Like this game could be played 10 times um, and maybe six of them would go 24, 20, but it could be the other four. Maybe it's five and five. I don't, I don't know. Um, so th- this game could go a multitude of ways. Takes one freaking turnover or one really bad fumble or missed face mask on a quarterback sneak um, to change this game. But I got 24, 20, which means a player two difference. And I think the bills make them in this one to, to keep us alive and hopefully go to Casey over Baltimore. Yeah. So, Hope everyone has a great, had a great holiday season. Thanks for tuning in to this Jack Action Pack Playoff edition, edition. Hopefully we come at you again with a victory Monday um, Playoff Week 2 edition rather than a sorrow edition. But from the Kevin and Jason show, I'm Kevin. That's Jason. Thanks, guys.